My name is Elena Lazic. I'm the founder and editor of Animus magazine, which is an online film journal. Um, and I'm only here because of Daniel Bird, who organized um, this masterclass and also the screening tomorrow that I hope you will have tickets for, The Screen of the Sky, where three films by Elias Merich will be showing um, on the dome of the planetarium. It's never been done before. Uh, so it's going to be a sort of, hopefully not once in a lifetime experience, because hopefully it happens in other planetariums around the world afterwards, but it will be the first time and it will be a unique experience. Um, yes, so I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, I can't really believe it's happening. Um, I saw Begotten for the first time during the pandemic. So a, a bit of a weird watch during that stressful time, but um, it made it all the more profound. And um, it's just incredible to be sitting right opposite Elias and talking this whole weekend and everything. Um, so yeah, there will be, um, you will be, uh, have a chance to ask questions um, near the end after a while. So, you know, start thinking about them. I'm sure you have loads. Um, but first, I mean, I can't see you. I was going to ask who here has seen Begotten, but I can't see you. So even if you raise your hands, I can see a few of them. Yes, amazing. Yeah, I see some hands. I see some hands. <laughs> Just in the darkness, yeah. Um, but um, I wanted to start by talking, uh, sort of setting the tone um, of this conversation by just saying, Elias, uh, many people here in the context of Offscreen, which is a sort of, you know, genre festival, but also, you know, festival of um, films of the beaten track. I think many people here probably know you for Begotten, your first film from 1989. But what's interesting as well is that, um, and that film is a cult film now, you know, people have seen it however way they could, you know, sort of telling their friends, smuggling copies, um, in that way, but you're also famous, I mean, because you've made films in Hollywood, um, you Oscar nominated films, um, Shadow of the Vampire in 2000, starring John Malkovich, Willem Dafoe, Eddie Izzard, and Carrie Elwes, whom I love, um, but also Suspect Zero with Aaron Eckhart and Ben Kingsley, Carrie Ann Moss in 2004. So you've made these more sort of commercial films, but you've also made music videos, including for, you know, Marilyn Manson, among others. Um, so yeah, I wanted to ask, um, what is it that for you, in just a few words, <laughs> I guess to, to kick off this conversation, what is it that connects all those apparently different things, different, you know, uh, sort of mediums as well, and different, you know, milieus of cinema and filmmaking and image making? Well, thank you for that introduction, Elena, um, and thank you all for being here. What connects all those different disparate mediums together is, is the love of creating a way of telling a story that speaks to us in a way that we haven't seen before. And um, I'm interested in giving and lending images to feelings that we all have that we don't necessarily have images to. And um, that becomes that becomes the primary uh, desire to to create those things. So if I'm making a commercial, I have to have a story that involves actors, that involves people, that involves something larger than a product, because for me, it's all about the emotion and the authenticity of what it is that you're communicating that makes something worth spending your time looking at and considering. And with a feature film, of course, there's a larger canvas. But what I like about commercials is that sometimes I can push the envelope in strange ways and do experiments with images and um, cameras and lenses that, uh, that then inform what I might want to do with a larger film. So all your, would you say that all these experiences sort of, you know, feed into each other? Do you, yeah. you don't strike me as someone who would even classify things in those disparate categories. Um, what do you make of the way that, you know, people at large, but also especially, you know, Hollywood and Los Angeles and people you work with, because you live in Los Angeles, 
that they might project these classifications and these sort of demarcations on things. How do you, what do you think of that? How do you deal with it? Well, uh, people like to pigeonhole uh, artists and uh, directors and, and certain actors too into, into these very limited spectrums of what they can and can't do. And, um, and I, I just find it kind of idiotic. It's, it's the result of an industry that's driven by enormous insecurities and, uh, and, and by people that don't necessarily understand the, the joy of, of, of just, when you're creative, there's a, there's a limitlessness to, to your desire to create things. And um, so if I find a creative person who is really great at painting, you know, I would never limit them to just being a painter. I would want to explore through conversation, through, uh, you know, through talking with them, you know, other mediums that they may be passionate about. Because there's something very beautiful about approaching a new medium for the first time uh, without any specific training or without any, you know, uh, without the weight of, of education about it or whatever. Um, you know, I've, I've met, I mean, one of my best friends, uh, Lee McCloskey, he is, he's an actor, but he's also a phenomenal painter. He has the draftsmanship of Albrecht Durer in the way that he's able to create images using his hands and his pencils and his pens and his oil paints. And at the same time, he's also a philosopher, he's a writer, a thinker, and you know, it, it makes me think of um, that there was a time when, when art and science were part of the same impulse in human beings. And, you know, and during the Renaissance, art, science, music, you know, the sacred, and um, painting, they were all part of the same desire to understand the great mystery that we're all faced with when we're born into a world that's essentially chaotic and terrifying until you begin to understand the rhythms of what's, what's around you. And the rhythms of life around you is what informs the music in a composer, informs the brush strokes in a painter, and informs the uh, song in a singer. So, you know, I feel as though to, to pigeonhole and say, oh, that person's great at comedy or that person's great at horror or that person, to start saying that a person belongs to a genre is, is really limiting their life force and their, their, deeper, their deeper well of, of creativity. It's interesting because, so you talk about sort of creation and just being an artist, whether it's a filmmaker or anything else, in this way that seems to be sort of, you know, drawing on your impressions as a person, you know, not necessarily on knowledge or, you know, learning from other people and just something very direct. Um, and it's interesting, I, I wanted to start talking about Begotten. So we're going to be showing clips from Begotten, Din of Celestial Birds, um, and Polly and Blastima, which are the three films showing tomorrow. But I want to start with Begotten, because this is the first one. Um, and um, what I wanted to say is that, um, for those of you who have seen Begotten or who haven't, one of the first images we see is a character. So there are, there's no dialogue in uh, any of those films. Um, and the first thing that I thought when I saw that film was how much this character looked like um, Leatherface in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, mm. which is obviously an incredible film. Um, so I was wondering wh whether that was even conscious from you, but also just more generally the place of you know, inspiration and references and taking inspiration from other people, other people's work, not just from your lived experience and you know being a person, but also like other arts that you like, mm. and what's the place of that with your work? You know. Mm. You know, it, it, if we're talking specifically about Begotten, Begotten is an entirely unique 
uh, approach. It's different from than most a lot of my other work, except there there are through lines, there are threads t from begotten to din of celestial birds and and polyamblastema. Um, they belong together. They really are a trinity of films that, over the course of 35 years plus, you know, I've uh, always dreamed of seeing the three of these works come together and live together. It's sort of like you're giving birth to these three children that, you know, look after each other and together they're so much stronger than being apart from one another. And that's why tomorrow night is one of the most special nights of my life because I'm going to get to see it, you know, for the first time all at once, all together on um, the screen of the sky. So uh, but when I think about Begotten, so much of that film was driven by a, a vision that really moved through me like, like a great storm. And it was something that, unlike anything else in the sense that I couldn't, I couldn't find myself happy or settled within myself until whatever it was that was moving through me was completed and finished and I could just sit back and look at it all, you know. Um, so what influences I was drawing on for Begotten? Probably more painting than I was for movies. And um, the sort of paintings that I loved were you know, paintings from, you know, er everything from uh, the symbolists of the 19th century to the Impressionists. There was something extraordinary happening with the Impressionists because the Impressionists gave you a vision of life that, that didn't match any of the lenses that I was working with as a photographer, you know, or as a cinematographer. So, I started chasing this kind of world that existed somewhere between painting and dreams in Begotten. And the figure of God killing himself um, was, it was, it was such an intimate uh, film shoot. But one of the things that I do want to clarify about Begotten is that when I originally wrote Begotten, I was 19 years old. and. Um, and I remember the night uh, in my in my apartment. It was a single. It was a, it was not a one bedroom apartment. It was a very small apartment, and um, and I had this uh, incident of sleep paralysis. And if any of you have had that, you know what I'm talking about. Where you just wake up and you feel like you're dying. You just feel like you're not moving. You're not breathing, and then something happens. You're able to shake yourself out of it. And uh, I woke up from this and I started just writing. And I remember writing long into the late, long into the early hours of the morning. And, uh, but one of the things that as I started to piece things together was that I really wanted to see this as a spectacular piece of theater, as something that, that approached opera, that approached this great spectacle of, of, of tragedy. And um, so I was really obsessed with finding a large enough theater space in, in New York City where I could do this. And one of the buildings I was looking at later became the Dia Foundation for, for the Arts, which was like this gigantic 40,000 square foot space. And I just wanted to be able to build the sets and have the audience in the center and have everything, the orchestra, the singers, the, the actors, the dancers, everything happening around them. So it was like a storm that would be happening around the audience. You know, something immersive, completely immersive and, uh, and beautiful. And what happened was is that that was such a, an expensive proposition that I had to rethink um, the whole, my whole approach. And, and so the thing that I was left with was, do I paint this? 
you know, do I, um, you know, what should I do with this? And, and I remember taking photographs one day through my camera and thinking that the frame of the camera was just perfect, that that would be the world that I could build this massive space in. And so that's how it became translated into a, into a film. And the reason why there's no dialogue in Begotten was because I had stumbled upon, there were these small theaters in New York City that would show, uh, they were collectives. And, um, and people would show different films that they brought from other countries, from, from, you know, they would be borrowed and whatever. And one of the films that I remember watching that struck me was 16 millimeter footage from uh, an Air Force, American Air Force camera that was used right after the bombing of Hiroshima. And what happened was is they sent uh, American reconnaissance scientists into Hiroshima soon after the blast and uh, they, and, and a medical crew. And so a lot of this was 16 millimeter, you know, not even carefully edited. It wasn't, it wasn't something you would show. Mm -hmm. It was just a collection of, of films, 16 millimeter films. And what struck me the most and what made me the most, uh, uh, just struck me with awe and, and sadness and, and terror was the fact that no one was talking, that all of the victims had this look of complete calm and just this calm astonishment as they looked millions of miles past the lens of the camera. And I remember thinking that when, when life becomes that extreme, that terrifying, when you see things that you can't unsee and experience things that no one can relate to on the entire planet, that you're really left with this spooky, terrifying silence. And that's when I decided in my own mind that it's ridiculous to have language, you know, in Begotten because it's a languageless place, you know, and it's not about that. It's about, it's on a whole other plane of expression. Mm -hmm. And so, so that was, I don't think I ever talked about that before. So that's something that, that was very important. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, I did not know that. <laughs> you did not tell me that. Um, Daniel, maybe we can play the first clip from Begotten. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so I picked this clip um, because I, I think it captures something uh, of that I think your project with Begotten, or part of it at least, 
um, especially that shot that's really um, the overexposed shot of the figure crawling on the horizon. Because I think in that in that moment, the, the silhouette almost, it, it barely looks like a human being. It's, it just looks like almost like a, a, a bit of ink sort of moving across the image. And I think it, 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 it's sort of an example of um, what I really like in Begotten, which is uh, the way the film exists between complete abstraction, literally just you know black and white colors on the on a screen, and then you know representation and figuration. Um, and you mentioned the impressionists, um, so I was wondering yeah, if you could tell us a bit about how you would even reach that image, and and yet yeah, what you you know what's the thinking behind it? Because I feel like for the audience, at least for me, when I watch it, you know, it's very, it's a very special, it sort of places you one foot in, this is a person crawling, and then one foot in, this is a much more primal image, playing just, you know, with the difference between mm. blackness and light. Yeah. Well, you picked a, a, a very, very cool scene. It, uh, it's, and it's a very delicate scene because it's, there's not a lot going on, and it, and it is really the solitary figure of uh, Son of Earth, who is played by uh, Stephen Charles Barry, who my collaboration with him was critical. He was such a, an extraordinary talent and someone who was so spiritually and uh, physically devoted to, to the work and I have nothing but admiration for, for Stephen and the work that he did. And, uh, but in this scene, what I did was I used these long lenses across a very hot sand, and that in itself created a distortion without, uh, you know, and I knew that on film, with, with a slight overexposure, that I would be able to later on I, I didn't know how later on what exactly I was going to do, but I knew I had to do something past just, I, I knew that I wasn't happy with just the 16 millimeter film that I was getting back from the lab. Like, and, and I was overexposing things on purpose, knowing that I would underexpose things later, though I didn't know how I was going to <laughs> underexpose them again. Uh, and that's when I had to we can talk about this later or now, the, I built the optical printer that I did all the re-photographing of the original film that I shot. So I would shoot the film and then I would take that original film and then I would put that through a projector portion of a system that I built and, uh, and then I would project the frame of what I shot onto a brand new film negative but then between the projector and the, the new film negative, I would use these uh, neutral density filters and different filters to be, and some color filters, some primary color filters, you know. And I was, uh, I mean, there, a book could be written about all the reasons why I used certain filters, certain colors, even though it's in black and white. and. Um, and then that's how that final image arrives, like that. But, but what it is is that it's, it's this moment of, of, of doom for Son of Earth where, you know, the, the Earth, the planet that he's on, whatever, I, I don't want to name it, you know, is completely arid and completely, you know, dead. You know, there's no life. and He is the only life crawling across it and he is basically the son of the god that suicided itself in the beginning of the film and his mother's gone and he's the only one left and um, and so how is the earth going to be renewed and he sort of knows as this creature crawling unconsciously that he's doomed though he doesn't know how yet and um, so there is that moment, and I think that you pick up on, where he becomes this worm, worm god, worm man, worm whatever, worm creature, 
and uh, so he's both human and a worm, and um, and it's from the distortion of the the long lens and the, the desert, the and uh, and so all of these things were were thought through, you know, and both consciously and unconsciously. But what was important to me is that by go going from a very clear image to an abstract, almost impressionistic image, it allows this gap between the cerebral cortex of the person watching and their limbic system, their amygdala, and their reptilian portions of their primordial brain. And, and these are the parts that I want to reach because it's like I'm trying to find the human soul not only in my audience but in, on film. And I'm trying to create a mirror that accurately brings these two things together in the experience of watching a film. And it's something that I'm still, still working with and still working on, you know. But in Begotten, it's, it's probably its most radical form of that. And be, being an entirely analog structured film that shot with, chem, you know, with, with film emulsion, film, light and lenses and cameras, it, um, it sort of takes on, I, I have the advantage of creating, uh, you know, building in a kind of flicker. I think there's something profound about projectors, the persistence of vision and how, you know, you have a series of still frames you know, moving through a projector gate that are, anim that are animated into motion. And the idea that that can happen because of some biological flaw in us is, is just an amazing, it's an amazing phenomenon. It's almost miraculous if you really think about it. And so I wanted to take advantage. If you're watching an analog film for two hours, there's literally an hour of the screen that is black. So I'm interested in, well, what is coming through from the other side? through that black space, that one hour that we're watching, sitting there in a dark cave watching these images flicker. You know, which makes me think of like Lascaux and how the first images that were painted, you know, they were painted not to entertain us. They weren't there to, for entertainment. They were there to initiate us. They were there to create relationships, sympathetic relationships between nature, between food, between the unseen worlds and those people that were s sitting in the cave around the firelight. So I feel the same way about cinema, that the cinema is, is a place where we can both dream and connect with those very deep parts within us that we're not even, that we're, not e that we're barely navigating because in the world that we live in now, we're being bombarded and assaulted and sold, you know, images. Images are being forced upon us to sell us desires, to sell us, you know, um, ideas that we don't even care about. And um, so the idea of bringing the image back to its primary use, you know, from Lascaux Caves is to bring it back to the sacred, to bring it back to, and what I mean by the sacred so I don't mean that in a religious context. You know, for me, the sacred are, are all those spaces of unexplained phenomena that surround our lives. That outside of our, you know, senses and outside of our social structures, there are things that happen to us, you know, thoughts that come into our minds, dreams that we have at night, nightmares, whatever they may be, that we can't explain or coincidences that make us think about the larger picture of how reality operates and works. You know, it's those spaces that don't, that don't have images, that don't have stories. Those are the places that I'm interested in, in focusing on, you know. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying about um, those things we can't explain, I feel like these are all the things that, you know, create change, it feels like. Because I think as human beings, we like to think that we can change things, that we have the power to control, but so much, I mean, you don't need to be alive very long to realize that so much is out of our control and things happen and 
why do they happen? And um, I feel like for me th this this brings me to the question of uh, the, 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 the choice you made to tell a story, because there is a story in Begotten, as you mentioned, you know, there's God killing himself at the beginning, then uh, Mother Earth, is mm -hmm. she, giving birth to the Son of God, and, you know, he gets murdered, and you know, there is a story, there is a narrative, but I was wondering why this narrative, why this narrative of, uh, you know, dealing with these mythical figures, I mean, I think I know the answer is because it's about creation and change. Yes. Uh, but yeah, how did you sort of, I mean, you mentioned that you wrote this, you know, in a strange sta state, you know, when you just woke up from sleep paralysis, but what is it that sustains this interest for you in those, in this sort of s mythical type of narration and narrative and stories? Because I think it was, uh, you know, I, I can't, I can only guess at an answer, actually. And I think I found, uh, I find so much of life to be a lie and to be just like bullshit. And um, that the truth of things really lies in things that we can't explain. And what you were saying earlier about the idea of controlling our life or controlling anything. I mean, there's absolute, it's absurd to think that you can control anything. The fact that we're sitting in these seats and we're alive and breathing, if you really start to deconstruct that, you could terrify yourself because what sustains us and holds us are very delicate threads, you know, in, in these bodies. And, um, and yes, we're strong, we're pioneering, we, send people into space, we build amazing things, we're amazing inventions, but we also build terrible things that, that torture and kill, you know, not only the earth, but each other and uh, create misery. And we create also beautiful things. We create the Sistine Chapel. But then you look at religions and the way that religion makes everything feel like it's ordered, that the universe is ordered and the universe has uh, a sort of uh, intelligence that is sustaining it. And that's partially true. But what's also true is that we are also suspended in a massive amount of, of chaos. I mean, if you think about the Earth itself, you know, hurling around the sun at 18,000 miles per second, and the fact that the only reason why we're held in this orbit that sustains life at the perfect distance from the sun is because the earth is trying to unchain itself from the sun. And because it is putting this force, this opposite force against, you know, the sun that's pulling it towards it, it holds it into that field of, uh, of distance from the sun. So it, um, everything is very precariously set into motion and uh, everything exists, you know, basically on the thinnest possible ice imaginable. And um, so I've lost my place in exactly what question I was answering. Uh, I was asking about the choice to tell the story of these mythical figures, mm. this, well, this choice of story, because you, well, you can't tell yeah. the stories in, your, in, your, in the other two films. Because yeah. Well, I think there's nothing more tragic and nothing more beautiful than um, the fact that even gods, even creation dies. And, uh, and I think it is something that is both offers a spectacle, a dramatic spectacle, but it also gives us a window into our own suffering and, uh, and to turn that suffering away from meaninglessness and fear and turn it into something beautiful, something creative, something to uh, inspire you. And that's ultimately what, what I want to do is I, I want to show young artists and artists that are working in different mediums that you're not limited by what you're seeing out there. Like you literally can just dream up something magnificent and no matter how 
disgusting or how sublime or how um, you know banal you might think it is it 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 could surprise you and become something that you never expected and you know a lot of a lot of begotten and um, even with palia and blastema you know we went it's 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 almost archaeological where you create one layer and then you create another layer and then those two layers begin to inform what the third layer is going to be. And then, you know, you, you get to a point where you have 10 or 12 different layers happening, and then you start to sculpt that even further and, and try to find, well, what is it that we need now, you know? I mean, uh, speaking of people with multiple talents, you know, my composer, Gavin Gamboa, who's in the audience, I mean, he is not only a magnificent composer, but he's also an incredible editor. And I realized when I was looking for an editor for Pollyanne Blastema that the perfect person to edit it is someone who wrote the music because he understands the, the primal rhythm of what it is that's taking place within the context of the story that we're telling. And, um, and that's my favorite part about filmmaking and working on anything creative is that the privilege of working and collaborating with somebody who is talented and brilliant enables you to go deeper and far further with your ideas and to realize them in ways that neither you nor your collaborators would have ever previously imagined. And what it, what it becomes is it becomes a kind of Jason and the Argonauts, you know, where you're just kind of like in search of the Golden Fleece and you're kind of wandering. And then you come upon something magnificent. You find an island where these incredible things grow that you've never seen before. And, and you cultivate it and you uh, nurture it. And I think that the, these are the, this is my favorite part about, about life is that not only working with people that I admire, that teach me many things, but also my films. You know, Begotten has brought incredible people into my life. It brought, originally it brought Susan Sontag, who uh, uh, I showed Begotten in her living room, to Annie Leibovitz, to Philip Lope, to about 20 incredible people that were from all different ethnicities and you know, and, and different, you know, just amazing people. And each one of them was way smarter than me. I was 25 at the time. And they taught me things that I didn't even think about. Like uh, they correlated uh, begotten to, to other works of art that I had not seen or not known of. And so it was incredible. Like I feel that begotten has taught me more about my own life and my own work and my own passions than, than, uh, than anything. And, uh, but it's the same with other films. It's the same, uh, you know, we only, we only premiered Polly and Blastema once at Opera Philadelphia, but we're going to premiere it here for the first time uh, tomorrow, tomorrow night. And, you know, that film causes many conversations and I'm looking forward to learning from that film. So, so films become teachers. You know, and, 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 and to tell you the truth, I, I make the films that I make because, because no one else is. And if I saw it in a movie theater, if I saw Begotten in a movie theater, I would be, I would be overjoyed, but I wouldn't, probably wouldn't feel the need to make it. You know, I'd be like, oh, somebody did a great job. Somebody did that, you know? And then I would find something else to, to, uh, to enjoy, to create. But, um, but you know, the, 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 real, the real thing is that now we're, we're at a place where, you know, the, the analog world is sort of disappearing rapidly and the digital world is, is all around us. And, and now we have AI and AI is in its infancy. So it's astonishing in its infancy. So if you can imagine what it will be like in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, you know, and um, so what I would encourage 
people to begin thinking about is to develop, you know, you know, we're still biological creatures. So I would cultivate things like handwriting, things like being able to draw, being able to paint, being able to write longhand, you know, not on a keyboard. Because these things affect the way you think. And the way you think affects the form that you create. And this is, uh, this is an important thing to understand. And it's important to be able to, to play and not feel restricted, not feel restricted by what other people think or what is going on socially, uh, but to, to just dream and be able to explore stuff that, that you are passionate to explore. Mm -hmm. Uh, what you just said about um, the analog world disappearing and digital sort of replacing it, even, even more than that, you know, changing it, changing us, um, it makes me think about how many, many people first saw Begotten on YouTube um, and in very low resolution. That's how I saw it, um, which is really interesting because it adds pixels to a film that is, does not have pixels initially. You know, it's, a, it's all about as you said, you know, the analog, the emotion, emotion, you know, sort of, you know, you could blow up the, the film that you shot on, on like, you know, 4K, IMAX, whatever, like th there's infinite detail because it's analog, because it's an object. Um, and then that also brings me to the, to what you mentioned earlier about uh, people watching, uh, being overwhelmed by the image and by, the, by this infinite nature within the film. Um, and how now, you know, we watch film, many people watch films and, you know, content, as people say, on small devices, and it changes the scale and changes that relationship. Yeah. And, and, and the fact that tomorrow you're showing your films in a planetarium, which is, I don't know how, I, I haven't actually seen it, but it's huge. Uh, it's, it's, it's more than just a big screen. It's, it takes the whole, your whole field of vision. Well, I mean, you're talking about something extremely important and that's part of what the screen of the sky is all about which is that as as we advance what's happening is that we're moving to smaller and smaller screens so when i was when i was growing up it, you know and you you know if you wanted to see if you wanted to see a film in the most special way you went to the zigfield theater in new york city and that theater was this giant movie palace that only showed 70 millimeter films and had massive screen. So films like uh, The Last Temptation of Christ, they'd be made in 35 millimeter, they were made, that was made in 35, but there were 70 millimeter blow up prints for these special theaters. And if you went to the Ziegfeld and you saw a film there, you were over engulfed, you were immersed not only in the image, but in the sound. And it became just an incredible, incredible experience. And now what you have is everything is moving to streaming. So if people are watching Netflix on their iPads, they're watching it on their computers, they're watching it on their phone. I, I mean, I had an experience um, 11 years ago where I was having lunch in uh, Los Angeles with, with Ian Asbury, the singer for the cult. And uh, he brought his son to lunch. And his son was on, a, was on an iPod, um, you know, one of those, you know, 180 gig, you know, iPods that existed at the time. And it's a small screen, about, about that big. And, and he was just with his headphones on, watching a film, ignoring the conversation. And so at some point I interrupted his son and I asked him what he was watching on his iPod and <laughs> it was Lawrence of Arabia <laughs> so I had to like so I immediately went into this lecture you know like like the old guy lecturing the kid about Lawrence of Arabia you know and I'm explaining to him that that was shot on 70 millimeter and I had to explain like I drew on the on the menu, you know, what a 70 millimeter frame looks like. And, and you know, the, the kid was adorable. He was fantastic. He, he, loved, he, he loved everything I was saying, you know, and was fascinated. Now he, want, he, wanted, he wanted to see it in 70 millimeter. But, but he was watching this movie 
that has shots in it that are designed that you can't comprehend on a small screen they're, because they're not designed for that. You know, that, that famous shot of, you know, Omar Sharif coming from, you know, for 12 minutes, he's, he's galloping towards Lawrence in the foreground. You know, the only way you can appreciate that is on a massive screen. So what I'm saying is, is that I want to go the opposite direction. I think that film is a spectacular medium and, uh, and it is meant to, uh, to, to bring us together, not to, not to push us apart. And if, and if people are looking at their iPhones and their iPads or streaming something at home and, and they're not given a reason to go out and to join with in, in an experience, I mean, that's what I want to give people. I want to give people an experience that they can say, you know what, I was there, I was at the planetarium, you know, on March 26th and I was, you know, and the director was there and, you know, we saw these films and the director was watching it for the first time, I was watching it for the first time and we were all equal. We were all experiencing the same thing and we were all eager to, to be excited and to talk about it afterwards. And that's, that to me is, is what's exciting. And, um, and with Begotten, you know, I was so uh, strict about that film never going onto video that I finally acquiesced where I, I, I couldn't send a print of the film to every single person I wanted. So, you know, at the time I remember I said, I'm only gonna make six VHS videos from a master that I would, I would master with, with my friend who had the telecity. And, um, and so we mastered Begotten, I put it on a VHS, and I made six VHSs, and I sent one to Vim Vendors because he asked for it, the other one to Werner Herzog who had, you know, wanted it, and then the third one I sent to uh, the Pacific Film Archive, and it was there that things started happening. So to tell you the truth, the story of Begotten getting out into the world happened through a VHS tape, didn't happen through a print. So, you know, it, it says something about, uh, about distribution and everything else, you know, but I kind of looked at Begotten as if it was a, a painting, because if you did, if you saw a beautiful print of Begotten up on the screen, you would think that, you know, Francisco Goya hand drew every single frame of that film. That's how beautiful it is. And there are no pixels. It's just, you have depth, you have, you have grain, you have film grain, you have light, you have flicker that I deliberately put into the film because I want, I want you to move into that unconscious dream. I want to reach the deepest parts of your, of your being through the image. And I want you to become a participant. I want you to be involved. And I think that's one of the things that we're craving these days is that so much of our lives is that we're standing as witnesses, you know, outside of experiences, you know, instead of being directly in it. And I'm talking about pleasant, good experiences, experiences that, that take us on journeys that, you know, we're, we're not used to taking. And, you know, we're just becoming this very passive, very consumer oriented culture. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the same, I'm part of all of that too, you know? I mean, I, I find myself watching Netflix and sitting there and, and enjoying a good show and, and it's great, but, but I do crave those experiences where, you know, where it, it is something that takes us, you know, and, and places us in a realm where we're not normally accustomed and, and it excites us and it makes our pulse move faster and makes our mind uh, begin to really, really think and dream. That's lovely. Uh, Daniel, can we play the second clip from uh, Din of Celestial Birds? Thank you.
Thank you, Daniel. Um, so I picked this clip because I, I love this track. I think the music is amazing. Um, but also because I, I mean, more, more seriously, because um, I, I really like how I think it's kind of maybe not the first time in the film, but uh, the most uh, clear moment in the movie where the music and, and, and the image are in sync. Um, and it, it creates this, I think, really pleasurable moment when they just get in sync like this and the editing goes in sync. And, um, and it's, just, it's just really pleasurable, but also I think, you know, works on a sort of like pure primal visceral level of just pleasure, of just, you know, enjoying seeing all those things. Um, and also because I think uh, Dinner Celestial Birds, in a way that uh, Begotten maybe doesn't, Dear Celestial Birds involves a sort of uh, more cosmic scale. Uh, we can see here, you know, there are cells and, you know, the, the microcosmic, but there's also the macro, macro level. Um, I was wondering if you could t talk about this. Um, but also, I just want to say, I think watching this clip right now on the screen, it, did, it was doing one of those things that I absolutely love uh, with films like this, where when, when it flashes, the whole room flashes, uh -huh. and I love that effect so much. There's a um, side note, but there's the, the Godard film Alphaville. At some point in the movie, there's a light flashing on the screen, mm -hmm. and it, the screen becomes the light flashing. Right. And it, it just makes you, you know, it just involves your entire yes. senses, your, all your senses, and that's what it does. But I had never seen it in the cinema, so I didn't know that until right now. Uh, well, you should, you should see it on 35 millimeter. I mean, it's even because the blacks are much more pronounced and, and it really has a mesmerizing effect. This is my collaboration with, um, with my first collaboration with David Wexler, who then we collaborated on, um, on Pali and Blastema, which is the most recent, the cosmic opera. This, this film is very interesting because it also involved Lee McCloskey, who I was just talking about in the beginning. And so it was a group of us creating something that was both a philosophical conversation in real life and, you know, a visual conversation on film. And, uh, and the things that you're responding to in this is that there are so many different formats being utilized here. There's 35 millimeter stills that, and that have been animated. And there's also uh, microscopic photography that I did some years ago. I've got a lot of uh, stuff that I shot through the microscope you know, of cells and animal life, you know, microscopic animal life moving. And, um, and so, and you're also responding to, uh, the, the composer on that was Ben Gillespie, and, and David and Ben brought, uh, introduced me to this Santeria drummer. So he was a drummer, but not for entertainment, for religious purposes and ritual purposes. And so we were able to record him, you know, during a ritual, you know, that we then took and, uh, and he knew what we were doing, you know, it's not like we were just recorded him and left. And, and he, he also recorded some stuff specifically looking at the images, you know, that we had later on because we loved the presence of the drums. The drums is that primal drive, that kind of like, that first electrical spark that puts life in motion, you know, and you, and you feel it, and it, it propels you through the film, and it's beautiful. Um, but, um, but, you know, what David, David was able to do is he was able to pull and unite all these different formats together into a unified, you know, aesthetic, you know, in, and um, that was... That was the first film that I had made where there were like innovative uses of digital and innovative uses of analog. And the two were, we created this kind of analog digital creature and that is what, what Din represents. We did some of that on Palia and Blastema as well, but ultimately we outputted everything onto uh, onto digital, a DCP file, you know, whereas with DIN, DIN was outputted onto a 35 millimeter uh, print. And um, so, 
So, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, one of the things I do want to mention, which is really important for me, is that after I finished Begotten and I, and I was alone on the, you know, with the, I, I was watching the film on what was called a Steenbeck, which is this flat um, editing table that has 16 millimeter soundtrack, you know, mag magnetic soundtrack on it, and it also has the 16 millimeter, you know, answer print film that has, uh, has uh, mylar plastic splices that are basically taped the whole film together and cut it together, physically cut it. And so I'm watching the film for the first time with, with sound and, um, and after it was over, I just was so depressed because I felt like the making of the film was, was the film. Like that was the real event. The real event was the ritual of the collaboration. Here I am with people that I love and we're enacting this drama in the middle of nowhere. And the only witness is this camera lens and me. And I'm part of it. I'm in it. I'm filming it. And now it's over. And it brought me back to, I thought that by turning Begotten into a film that I took the ephemeral away from it. Because the thing about theater and the thing about theater material and the thing that attracts me to theater is the fact that theater is so ephemeral. It's like writing on water. And you know, once, once you've done it, the only people who remember it are the people that were there. Just like the only people that are gonna remember this talk are the people that are here. And there's something, there's something so poignant and so beautiful about that and heartbreaking about it. And I thought that I was escaping that, moving more towards this immortality of, you know, the birth and death of gods in Begotten. But I, was, I remember being alone with the editing machine and the movie finished and I remember thinking to myself that I've still been you know, I, I'm still heartbroken because now, because the experience has been recorded, but, but yet there's, it, to me, the film, to, to me at that moment, Begotten was the smoke, the smoke ascending to the sky and the flame that created the smoke was gone. And and that poignancy is what propels and drives my poetry. That is the core of like, you know, where I create from. Is that I, I think that I trick myself into one direction and then I realize that I've out-tricked the trick. And, and, and there's a certain kind of foolishness that you're faced with within yourself. And, and it's in those moments that I feel that I can laugh at myself and at the same time cry for myself, you know, in the sense of, um, you know, that I allow myself to fall in love with these illusions that, that um, you know, illusions about theater, illusions about film, you know, and, um, and so, so it's actually a beautiful process. It's a beautiful dance, you know, just in, internally. It hasn't, you know, it's got nothing nothing to do with anything else except just me being alive and, and creating these things and you know but the thing that I love the most is is the family that's created whether it's a theater production or a film production um, you know and and Gavin who edited the film and composed the music for Polly and Blastema you know after it was done I, I remember the night it was like it was like June 8th you know, 2020, that I was watching the film in the dark in my house. And, and I realized that was the last edit. That was the last music edit, the last edit, you know, visually. And it was done. 
And so I had to, I had to call Gavin and we spent like three hours on the phone, like just talking about not only the film, but like, but almost everything else, you know, around, around the film, like what the film makes us feel and what it, how, you know, where, 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 where was this journey of polyemblastema? Where had it taken us? And now I was able to see from a different vantage point, like where I was and in relation to the art. And the only person that I could talk to was Gavin because he was with me, you know? So there's a certain kind of beauty in these collaborations. And so, you know, what I would say to the artists and the filmmakers and people that, you know, are in this audience, you know, is, is to really treasure the people that you work with and, uh, and to, to nurture those relationships. Um, because that's where you're going to experience the, um, the growth. Mm. It's interesting because uh, you talk about this effect of, you know, finishing the film and facing, you said you used the word foolishness. It makes you feel foolish for pursuing those things that are ephemeral or unattainable or all that. But then you talked, you segued beautifully to the pleasure of realizing that, you know, you have people to share it with. And it's this sort of contrast. And uh, it's interesting because you, you know, we talked about Begotten and this film and Polyam Blastima who are, that are quite, you know, not abstract, but, you know, they're not literally about filmmaking. But then you did make a film about filmmaking where you mention all those things, you know, in a much more commercial context, which is um, Shadow of the Vampire, mm. in which John Malkovich plays Murnau as he shoots Nosferatu. And uh, Willem Dafoe plays Max Schreck, who played Nosferatu. And it's amazing because it's a film, you, everything you just said is in that movie, where John Malkovich is so obsessed with chasing that authenticity. But what he doesn't do is nurture those relationships, as you say, you know, it, it ends really tragically <laughs> for everyone else. Um, and it's interesting because it, what you, when you mentioned this idea of, you know, feeling like your project is, you know, you feel a, a bit foolish. It's interesting because the film, Shadow of the Vampire, is really funny. <laughs> and so you have this sense of, sense of humor about what you're doing as well, while being very earnest in your pursuit, which is, you know, really refreshing and really, exciting as well because it it sort of makes you because maybe people in the audience are you know thinking this is a, you know this is a great project like it's, it's it, it makes sense you know trying to chase that 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 dream that authenticity that connection but you know do you walk around telling people that's what you're doing yes you do but then you also realize that you know it's it's a pursuit it doesn't maybe it never fully gets completely achieved and successful but that's fine you know Yes. yes. I don't like to have a question, but you know, it's, I just find it, it's not intimidating, it's liberating. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And that's where, you know, Murnau is missing out. I mean, Malkovich's character as Murnau is missing out on being able to laugh at himself, you know, that there's nothing more hilarious than somebody who is obsessed and deadly serious about something they're pursuing. Is something really funny about that. And I've, I've caught myself in that place, and and uh, I mean, when you're in it, you're not you're not laughing, and 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 God help anyone who's laughing at you while you're <laughs> in those moments. But after those moments, it's it's quite hilarious. And uh, but uh, with with Shadow of the Vampire, definitely, I wanted to explore the the both what goes on in the artist's mind, which is sort of insane type of obsession. I'm talking about real art. I'm talking about great art. I'm not talking about decoration. I'm not talking about mimicry, which is a lot of the stuff that gets made. A lot of movies mimic other movies. They're spin-offs of something. They're franchises, whatever. I don't care about that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the real stuff, the stuff that moves us the song that we can't get out of our head because it breaks our heart and it makes us want to love even harder. And that sort of thing is, is very special. And that comes from a kind of madness that, that is both serious 
and obsessive, but at the same time, uh, really beautiful because it can be shared. You know, and that's, that's I, think, I think we all have magical moments in our lives that we would love to be able to like write the script to try to define those moments and film them so that we could show the world like, hey, I, I'm alive and these are the extraordinary things that I think and that I feel and that I'm moving through the world with. You know, do you feel it too? Do you see it too? Do you, do you, do you find it as astonishing as I do? And, and I think that that, I think that is the beauty and the redemption of, of you know, not only being a person, but, but being an artist. But I don't think, I think that where I want to move with things like the screen of the sky and where what we're experiencing this weekend is I want to move towards a more immersive, you know, like I want to transform Begotten. And it's funny because I wrote Begotten with the idea of turning it into an opera and a live theater piece. And, and then I wrote, and then when I was writing the libretto for Polly and Blastima, I was thinking, I'm making, I'm making an, a, a, a cinematic opera that I want to turn back into, into a live opera. And so with these three films, with Begotten, Din of Celestial Birds, and with Polly and Blastima, I am not going to stop until I get them onto onto an opera stage, whether it's La Monnier here in, in Brussels or, or elsewhere, I will get this onto a stage and, and it's going to be something immersive, something very different from the 19th century operas, that, which I love. I was deeply influenced by, by uh, Nietzsche and Wagner as a teenager and, and, you know, in a way, it was opera that made me see that it was opera that made me get into theater in the first place and then made me realize that the 20th century version of opera was cinema because you could incorporate everything from stage to music to soundtrack to you know world making which is what which is what the great operas are they're worlds yeah. that you inhabit and this is this is what i'm interested in uh, as an artist is, is creating works that immerse you, that completely immerse you so that you for a moment can forget who you are. You can get lost in the maelstrom of the cosmos and in a way that helps you to, you know, come back a much richer person. On that note, I think we should play the third clip uh, from Polian Vastima. Great. <laughs>
Thanks, Daniel. Um, so it's kind of a shame because you can't really tell, I think, from, from this uh, projection, because it's quite pixelated again. Um, but what really struck me when I first saw polyadenastema is the, um, it's, it's really high res. It's kind of, it, the, the aesthetic is quite different from begotten or dinocelestial birds where, you know, you get uh, in those films that were like kind of like blobs of color or, of black and white. And here you really get so much texture and detail. Um, and I was wondering, yeah, how did you get to that point? I feel like also that's a kind of aesthetic choice that seems to go well with the choice of having, you know, really opera music and singing. It's very, it's, there's an idea of detail, of, of, of feeling the things pass in, the, re, in the, the, the grain of the music and of everything and the, the little changes. It's just, it's just a, it feels like a slightly different type of experience of like the way it passes through you is slightly different. It's more, yeah, go ahead. So what is the question? Uh, yeah, um, just basically how did you reach to that, the idea of doing this aesthetic where First of all, the screen is much wider, and and there's some there's a level of detail and texture. Well, part of that is built into the uh, to the actual filming, and um, uh, something I want to say is that the quality of polyamblastema and din of celestial birds and begotten is significantly better than what we've been seeing yeah, on yeah, this yeah. screen. It won't be like this tomorrow. Yeah. it'll be like actual. Yeah. So I just want to make that clear. Uh, but part of that was part of the archaeology that I was telling you about. It was conversations with um, my visual designer and, and friend and collaborator David Wexler, and with uh, you know Gavin, my uh, my composer, but also my editor. And it's it's a lot of conversations, and that's what I love is these these conversations where there's things that you just know are not working and that need to be <clears throat> addressed. But how do you address them? And is it, is it a matter of reshooting something or is it a matter of building a new software that will help you translate that feeling into the color, into the form of that image? And, and one of the things that, um, you know, because this happens in space with these, these, this, these Gnostic, you know, kind of gods that that, that come from the beginning of things, you know, that come from the first supernova. You know, they, you know, in this whole volcanic, the nature that volcanoes, like, are, are the things that move through our blood, that move through all of us, that this is where the gods are born, you know, in that first cataclysm, that first explosion that separates Palia and Blastema apart across you know, large swaths of black space, you know, and that's why you get those shots of the loneliness of the stars, the separation of everything, you know, because they've gone from a place of absolute unity to a place of, you know, complete and total dualism and separation. And um, so these conversations that David Wexler and I would have, you know, with Gavin would have, and the group of, you know, really the three of us, it, you know, started to, you know, become like, okay, how do we take this to a place where, where we are envisioning space not the way NASA shows it to us and not the way the Hubble shows it to us, but taking what we see from these images and intuiting what would be deeper, what would be, you know, what would, be, from the, if we took light from the beginning of the universe, what would that reveal? And so that's the kind of, paintbrush we started painting with, you know, and, um, and one of the things that's so interesting is that the Webb telescope uh, w became operational just days after we finished, you know, polyamblastema, and it started sending images back that started to look a li little bit like our star fields that David was building in his studio, and it was it was really kind of beautiful. We were all very humbled by the Webb telescope that we felt like it was a, a counter, like kind of like a brother or a sister to to Pali and Blastema. That the two were both, you know, reaching like one was in was an art, artistic reach 
for the beginnings of the cosmos, and the other was this scientific reach that also was equally as insane and, um, you know, reaching for the beginnings of the cosmos. And the two became kind of like dancing partners for us uh, for those uh, few, few months. But anyway, it was, it's, um, yeah, Palia is gorgeous. You know, we, when, when we saw it on screen at Opera Philadelphia where it premiered, we went in and did a, a sound check for the theater. It was a 500 person theater, so it was a large theater, state of the art. And it was raining, it was Philadelphia, and it was cold. And, and we were, it was David, myself, and Gavin, and Nadja, who's my wife, who's the executive producer on, on Pali and Blastema. And, um, and we were just sitting in the audience. And they played 10 minutes of Palia, and it was so gorgeous. We had never seen it like that because, like you said, during the pandemic, we were working separately and we were, you know, uh, Gavin would send me, you know, image files of small edited sequences and then we would talk about that on the phone. We would Zoom and, you know, and, and talk to each other on FaceTime, whatever. So then finally, here we are, we're all together. We're in a theater on the large screen. Is this going to work? And it, it was just gorgeous. It was like looking up at the Sistine Chapel, you know, and that's, and that's, that Sistine Chapel idea is really where the, uh, you know, the screen, the screen of the sky. It's like what, 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 you know, I, I, one of the conversations I had with David Wexler early on was, can you imagine, like, the paint is drying in the Sistine Chapel, and you're one of, like, the first three people that walks into this room, smell of paint everywhere, and you're looking for the paintings on the walls, and you don't see much. And then you finally, you look up, and your mouth just gapes open. And there you are, struck with awe. Well, it's that kind of attention to the image, that kind of sincerity, that kind of magnificent genius and beauty that very consciously, you know, as a group of us, we wanted, you know, to see in Palia and Blastema. And, and feel that, to strike that sense of awe of seeing something new that was sacred and sort of like gave you your place in the chaos of it all. Mm. It's interesting because the idea of um, showing a film uh, on a big screen, or, I mean, on a big screen, a standard screen, but especially in a planetarium is it's kind of the perspective, the idea of perspective as an audience, you know, the way, you know, Plato's cave is imagined where, you know, someone's sitting there and the image is showing there and someone's doing the shadows. And there's the idea of, you know, you are stand placing here and the screen, the frame is your pers perspective. It's about you, it's about who you are. But if you're watching the sky, you know, no matter where you are sitting in the planetarium, sort of the image is kind of the same, you know, it doesn't, it's not about you. And it kind of changes your perspective as a, as a viewer. Um, and yeah, and the idea that you were already sort of trying to do that with Poly and Blastema, even though it wasn't a planetarium idea, it was a standard screen. Well, Gavin brought something up yesterday when we were doing the test at the planetarium. And he was sort of drawing this conical shape and on one end was uh, the idea, like, we, what we started talking about is the fact that a planetarium was designed for science. It was designed by scientists to, to, you know, give us this microcosm with which to examine the macrocosm of the, of the cosmos. And the earliest stories go back to that period where we were lying on the ground looking up at, at the night sky, and that's where the zodiac comes from, where we started to tell stories you know, from the stars. And, and so this is really what, what we were talking about in the planetarium, is that here we're in a space that's designed scientifically to explore and make sense and unpack the mysteries of the universe through science. And yet, that's what we were doing, making Pali and Blastema, trying to unpack the mysteries of the cosmos. And actually, all three films are are exactly done, made with that desire is to unpack the mystery that 
brought us all to this tiny little rock that is circling the sun, you know, and that we tell stories on, that we laugh, we cry, we have, you know, beautiful moments, some horrible moments, and, and you know, this is what makes it so, so extraordinary that we're putting art and science together tomorrow night in, uh, you know, like it was in the Renaissance. And, and I feel like that is the direction that if we're going to be a healthy society and a healthy civilization, that we need to think about integrating, integrating more and less specialization. Because now, now we have these regions of specialization where, you know, we're, we're, we're creating miracles with like CRISPR-9 and, you know, gene editing and, you know, eventually going to be able to eradicate severe diseases and suffering in people through, you know, this incredible creativity of science, you know. But at the same time, these scientists and painters, and storytellers, we all need to be, we all need to be speaking to each other, and we need to be uh, uh, learning from each from one another, and also become inspired by one another. And I think that you'll have a much richer society where we're not just uh, like putting our brains on pause because you know ChatGPT can just write whatever we want or tell us whatever we need to know. And, um, you know, there was a tradition in the Renaissance and a tradition in ancient Greece called the art of memory. And actually, I'm thinking about something very important, which is the Homeric tales, like the Iliad and the Odyssey. These were memorized. I mean, think about it, you guys. The, these stories were memorized, like 1,000 pages. Somebody memorized them and told them, told these stories around a fire over the course of many evenings, many nights. And... The idea of internalizing a story like that so that it would be preserved for hundreds of years before it would ever be written down is just mind-boggling. And that's why I encourage artists today to, to read and to remember and to exercise you know, your, your knowledge and your memory and incorporate um, different analog forms of expression because you are a biological creature and the way that your nerves and neurons and your heart and, and inspiration and imagination begin to grow is through exercising these things. It's just like if you don't move, if you never walk or exercise, you know, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna get high blood pressure, you're gonna get cholesterol, whatever it might be, and, uh, and you're gonna stop uh, being healthy. And so it's the same thing in, um, in, in our world that, um, you know, I, I would love to see, um, you know, a, a geneticist talking to a painter, mm -hmm. you know, and see what kind of dialogue comes out of that, you know. Um, it's interesting because you, um, you talk a lot about not just the importance of like analog, but also of like reading and words. And you clearly, you love, you, you were talking about how much you love talking with people after an experience like, you know, watching a film or, or anything that's kind of overwhelming and brings you to that different way of being. Afterwards, you, it's not like you're saying, I want to be in that state of being all the time where I'm, you know, I'm at one with the universe and disconnected from more mundane reality. It's that you're saying we can talk about it in a more mundane reality. We can connect even though we're not in that state of being. We can all relate with words with language and with books. And you were telling me about how you have loads of books at your house, you know, very old books. And it's not just, it's not just information. It's, no. it's about using a common language and also, you know, even misunderstandings, you know, the gaps between language, stuff happens there. Like when you talk to a person or when we talk now, we don't necessarily, you know, we're not just like computers. We're not like chat GPT, which is gonna say one thing, repeat the other thing, and that's it. There's, things happening as we do it. And so the, I just think the place of language is really interesting in your work because in those three films, there is no dialogue. In Polyam Blastima, there is a libretto with um, English singing, but you don't really use words. Um, yes. And it's interesting how you're talking about how you want to expand those experiences 
through dialogue and conversation. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I walk around basically starving all the time with an immense hunger to be astonished by something somebody says to me or by something that I see, whether it's in an art gallery or not in an art gallery, it's on the street, it could be anywhere. And I, I just, I just, I crave that. And I know that other people too, do too. You know, that we all, um, there are these huge swaths of just boredom, and, you know, these boring swaths of space between the exciting moment, the moments that we're inspired, the moments that we get, um, where we really feel alive. And so I think some of it is that we've, we've never had greater ease being able to talk to one another, you know, electronically. And yet, I very rarely walk into a cafe and see two people in a heated conversation over any subject or something. They're always at a computer, you know, in their own world with their headphones on, you know, and, you know, so I, I think the, the act of, of physically hanging out and having like real conversations about things is, 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 is something that is a, a critical part of, a part of growth and also I think it's healthy. Um, I was thinking, yeah. do you think that's maybe related to what you were saying, how technology and the ways we communicate actually affect what we want to say and how we communicate? Because I feel like a big impression that people have, the reason they don't, you know, talk for no reason in cafes is there's a sense that that's not important to do and nothing concrete is going to be said in those conversations in cafes or in bars. That it doesn't matter. What matters is what a computer can understand and what can be, you know, turned into data and information that a computer is going to use. Well, I think that with something, I mean, since we're talking about AI, and that's what we're referring to. I think that can be something that if you come to AI and you have done the work, and what I mean by do, have done the work, have read the books, done, you know, done your journey uh, in terms of like really learning as much as you can about a specific thing that you're, that you're passionate about, you know, and then you come to AI, then you can distill, well, what is bullshit coming from this machine? And what is, what, you know, you can use the machine to, to jar your mind or shock you into a different mode of, of rethinking what you've already thought through. But if you're looking to the machine to think for you, then, you know, you're going to become an idiot, you know, and you're going to, just not, you're going to be susceptible to, you know, not only the thoughts of a machine that's just basically throwing stuff at you, but also other people. And we all know from the, the people that are leading the world right now that, that, you know, you have to be able to think on your feet. Otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully you don't approach just AI critically. You have to approach everyone, right? Yeah. Everyone yes. you talk to. Um, yeah, um, I think maybe we should watch the last clip from. So f it's um, so just for context, it's the it's what's going to be shown tomorrow, but because we don't have a planetarium screen, um, it's just a round image. So it's just to give you guys a sense of what what the sort of work of adapting the films to that format has been like, and what it looks like, which is not like anything I've ever seen before. So enjoy.
you, Daniel. Um, so yeah, as you can see, it's something quite special. So this was an extract from Deno Celestial Birds, which has been adapted for the planetarium screen. Um, I was actually just curious generally about how the idea of the planetarium came to you. So was it, it's, it's just strange because from what I understand, it was Daniel's idea, um, but it feels like it was already present in your work. It feels like it should have been, almost like every film you've made should have been shot that way <laughs> from the start. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how it happened, because it's just such a, such a bold idea. Mm. Well, when, before meeting Daniel, which uh, I was introduced to Daniel through my business partner, Richard, and, um, he had reached out to Daniel and had a great conversation with him, and then the three of us got on the conference call together. Before that, Richard and I were in talks with IMAX, and, um, and I had sent polyemblastema to two executives at IMAX, thinking that, that we would be just laughed out of their you know, offices. But, they actually came back to us and said, you know, we love these, this film. And, you know, we're actually interested in figuring something out. And they said that actually they had a short film by Terence Malick, and that because of the length of polyemblastema, it might be like this double feature that they could, that they could do. And so we were entertaining the idea of, of of that with IMAX, and then we got into a conversation with Daniel, and, and, and Daniel it just has such a deep and thoughtful way of understanding film, not as entertainment, but film really as, as an art form that can change your life. You know, that it has the gravity, the gravitas of, of being able to do that, and great films, we all know from the great films that we love, that films change our lives and make us feel and see in ways that we previously would have never imagined. And, um, and it really became a, a dialogue over the course of two years. And then Daniel proposed this idea of having three domes, you know? He proposed the idea of a dome. And so he took the IMAX screen, which was you know, against the wall, you know, and turned it up this way, which I very much love because it spoke to that dialogue that I was referring to that I had with David Wexler about, you know, the Sistine Chapel. And um, so with, with, with the primitive notion of what became the uh, screen of the sky, the, the first iteration of that was that there was a section at the Rotterdam Film Festival that had these alternative ways of presenting films. You know, it was a kind of like a laboratory or workshop that, uh, that Daniel had known the director of that particular um, segment of the festival. And the idea would be that we would have three domes that people could wander between. So, you know, Begotten would be on a loop on this dome, formatted for the dome. You know, Din would be in another dome. And you could basically wander between the three and begin to edit your own, you know, immersive experience with the three films. And then that evolved into this idea of, uh, of, of putting it in a planetarium context. And I think that the if, you know, if Daniel was the gasoline, the fire would have been, uh, would have been Dirk and the off-screen festival. So, you know, it was, it was through Dirk who I've had a long time relationship with. I love Dirk. His festival represents just a certain quality of uh, vision that you don't see anywhere else. And I admire that. And, um, and, and Dirk and Daniel, the two of them talking, it just sort of just ignited. And it was like, ah, you know, we have a planetarium here in Brussels. And, you know, and next thing you know, they're, they're both calling me and telling me, you know, what, 
that, that this is happening and this is what we're going to do. And, and I was just so excited. I mean, tomorrow night, like I said, you know, I mean, uh, my wife and I, we've, we've been to the Oscars, you know, we've been to some, we've had some special moments, you know, in, in my professional life. But tomorrow night is going to be among the most special moments that I've ever had. And, uh, and I'm just so glad to be alive, to be able to experience it with all of you that are going to be there, you know, uh, because, you know, for, for Gavin and I and, and for, for Daniel and for Richard and for, um, you know, Francesca and everybody that's been involved in our small little family to get this, get this going, um, it's going to be a completely new experience for us because we want to know how it feels and, you know, have the opportunity to, to, talk, to, uh, to talk to people, you know. Because I want to involve this. I really want to involve this circular screen. You know, I'm actually thinking about, you know, uh, I'm going to be talking to a couple of camera companies about modifying the whole, taking it away from the, the square image, you know, and, and creating a circular image. And it, it, there were cameras that actually had this at some point, but then it fell into disuse or obsolescence. So, so anyway, the, circular, the circle is a profound uh, format, mm -hmm. prof profound framing, and you see it in a lot of medieval, you know, uh, paintings and illuminated manuscripts. You see this, the circle, and it's always associated with the uncanny, the sacred, those liminal places that we can't really, you know, understand completely. I think even Eisenstein was writing about this, that films should have, you know, all kinds of shapes and formats and aspect ratios. It was never, the idea of doing a rectangle was kind of, you know, established later for convenience mostly. Um, but I really like what you say about how you're, lo you're looking forward to discovering what it's going to be like. The, the idea that you, throughout your career, you've been doing these things and being like, you don't know what it's going to be like. Mm -hmm. You just, you just want to try it and see what happens. Well, it's kind of like Oppenheimer with the, you know, the first nuclear test site where they exploded the first atomic bomb after working on the Manhattan Project. You know, they're out in the desert in Los Alamos in New Mexico, and they were worried that that the sky might ignite and the whole planet gets, you know, goes extinct. You know, they, they had no idea what to expect from that first blast. And, and, it's, uh, and it's interesting that that was called the Trinity site. And, you know, I've been referring to these three films as a trinity because they are, they exist together. And, uh, and it was something that I had originally intended, the idea of a triptych. Because, uh, you know, you look at Hieronymus Bosch's work, and a lot of them, his most profound work was done in triptychs. You look at uh, one of my favorite painters, Grunwald, from, you know, and his depictions of, uh, you know, of, of the suffering of Christ were done in these triptychs that were just extraordinary, that had a huge influence on me from an early age. And uh, so tomorrow night is going to be... I, I'm going to be just like any of you. Like, uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I just hope, I hope it's a great experience. I hope it's something that, that changes us and that we... I, I do know that it, it's going to be a communal experience, that everybody there, I'm going to re remember every one of the faces of everybody that's in that planetarium because that's how special tomorrow night is for me. Um, do we have, uh, it would be nice yeah, if we can bring the lights up to see questions from the audience. Um, it, will, it will happen soon, if you guys have questions. Yes. Yeah. And so the plan is I'm going to give one of the mics cause, so that you can use it. Uh, I'm going to come, I guess. Here you go. Immersive experience. Here you go. Yes, um, hi. Uh, I'm here to your right, uh, to your left. Yeah. I see you. Um, as you said, this, this is a, a project that spans 35 years of your life. 
which means that but and p- people evolve which means that the person who makes begotten is not the same person who made the last part to what extent do you see this project as a reflection of your own life and the way you've evolved and what a beautiful question um I, I feel like that these three films, they, they represent, one of, the, one of the things that we talked about was, um, was that the idea of going from the first supernova, which is the Big Bang, to the forest floor. So what you'll see is the beginning of poly, I'm not ruining anything, it's like the beginning of poly and blastema is you experience that first supernova and then you see these two piece, these two balls of light separating and then you come to understand them as these two twin gods that were united and now find themselves in separate bodies and they're trying to find their way back to one another. And you, so you start with that image and then the very last image is this sh- shot of this forest floor, this forest. Like the trees are bare, there's no leaves, everything is perfectly still. And, you know, the idea of going from the dirt, you know, th- from the first supernova to the dirt and the bare trees of a stark, still forest, it just for me, brings this epic feeling of uh, the exuberance of birth, the exuberance of youth, and the, the tumult of these two gods trying to find each other's skin to crawl back into, you know, which is, which is part of, I think, adolescence and growth and, and, uh, and the idea of then finishing on this, the stillness of this forest. It becomes a very Zen image for me, and it becomes very relaxing, and and I think that's where I feel like uh, after having been through all the things that we go through in life, you know, you you come to a place where you realize that the conversation I'm having with you right now is really the most important thing in my life. It's not about you know the next premiere. It's not about what I'm going to do next. It's I mean, all of those things are the byproduct of what we're doing right now, which is trying to figure things out and trying to understand, you know, each other and the larger picture that surrounds us. So in that regard, um, you know, whether it's having a cup of tea, you know, or a great cup of coffee with a friend, having that conversation or showing, sharing a book from my library with somebody who I know is going to fall in love with it and appreciate it, then it's, it's those moments that are, that are like the forest floor. So the forest floor image is, sim- is a si- beautiful symbol of the calm in the, mil- you know, in the middle of the supernova, in the middle of the, the chaos. And so there's something kind of gorgeous about that. I have a question. Oh, you have a question? Uh, yeah, go. Uh, I can't bring yes. you the mic, but yeah, just I, shout. I, took down. <laughs> uh, I had a question uh, with, for your collaboration with uh, Marin Manson. You shot uh, a video clip for uh, the song Crypto Child, I guess. Yes. Uh, on the album Antichrist Superstar. And to me, that's really uh, the most in- interesting um, period of Marin Manson. And so my question is, uh, how, were you, how did you meet him? How were you connected, and how did you felt connected with the world of uh, this album and the thematic in it? Okay. Uh, Marilyn Manson was mixing his first his first album, Antichrist Superstar, at at a sound studio that uh, Trent Reznor was Trent Reznor was producing that album and. Uh, so it was at Trent Reznor's studio in New Orleans, and that's where uh, Marilyn Manson had called me from that studio. And so basically, I, I forget how he got my phone number, but those were the days of you know, landlines where you picked up the phone, and you know, it's, it's comical to see now, but 
that's how it happened. It was literally the phone was ringing and I picked it up and it's like, hi, I'm Marilyn Manson. And I thought it was a joke, you know. Uh, and so I said, come on, what's, what's your real name? You know? And he's like, well, it's, it's Brian. You just call me Brian, that's fine. And we had this conversation and he said, I've been mixing Antichrist Superstar and we have your film begotten on a loop so it's playing 24 hours a day in Trent's sound studio. And that's our inspiration for making the entire album. So I'm calling you because, yes, I want you to make a music video for me, but I also would love you to design. You know, I know that you have worked in theater, and I'd love you to design this show. You know, we're going to do this world tour, and this is, you know, the record company was Interscope at the time, and I would love you to do the, the sets for me, you know, and design it all. And so I did, and kind of, like, kind of like what happened with Begotten, where I designed myself into extinction, because this, you know, what I wanted to do with Begotten was so expensive, so exorbitantly expensive, that it couldn't, it couldn't be done at the time, and it was cheaper for me to make a film than to do a theatrical operatic pro live production. And so that's what happened with Marilyn. I sent him all the designs, everything I wanted to do and how the staging was going to be. He sent me a cassette tape of, uh, of the music that hadn't been mixed yet uh, to its final state. Uh, and, um, and so the record company did not sign off on the design for the world tour because it was too expensive to, to build and to light and to do. But they did commission me to do the, the music videos. And when I made the music video, I said the only way I'm gonna make the video is that whatever I shoot, um, I'm gonna be hand developing in a, in a bathtub. And, you know, I don't know, you know. It, it, it's the way it comes out is the way it's going to come out. And, um, and so what I did is I did some tests, of course, and I knew how it was going to come out, but they agreed and I, and I shot that video. And that was it, really. He invited me to a few concerts, but I, you know, it's like, uh, I mean, I like his music, I don't love it. <laughs> Uh, other questions? Yeah. Thank you for your time. Um, so I have a question about Begotten. Um, so you mentioned that it's the exciting part of uh, uh, reflecting on yourself when you're into something really seriously, and then it gets comical. So in that sense, uh, for me, uh, your process of working on Begotten from the moment of this lucid dream quite mysterious like can you remember what kind of feelings you had after you wrote down this dream and then at the, till the moment of uh, when you kind of completed it to, to the level of production that it was able to transform it into a movie from your dream into the movie so this kind of well you're you're talking about it's, what you're talking about is very interesting, and it's a much deeper discussion. Um, you know, one of the things that has moved me in my life is that, you know, when, when I was a child, I got, I got sick a lot, you know, and I would have these fevers, these very high fevers, and you know, we've all had fevers, so we understand that you begin to think and experience things differently, you know. So sometimes during these fevers, I'd have fun reading or writing poetry, whatever it might be. And just the kind of uh, ways of thinking that come out of that was, was really interesting. And then, I, and then um, I've had a few near-death experiences. And the one that I had was in an auto accident just months before I had the sleep paralysis. So I thought from the sleep paralysis that I had actually 
died and that I was dreaming those few months that I was actually alive. And now I was understanding that I was actually not alive in that sleep paralysis. But then the sleep paralysis wore off and I was like, okay, well, what was that? Now, during the, the near-death experience with the auto accident, my friend was giving me mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, keeping me alive until the ambulance came. And um, I remember having the most extraordinary um, vision that I only remembered 10% of. So when I actually came out, of, came back to consciousness from that auto accident, I, the first thing I wanted was a tape recorder or a pen. Like, I didn't give a shit about, like, being okay. I was more concerned with writing all this shit down because it was, it was running away from me. It was almost like it was like a sprinter running directly away from me as I was gaining. Something happens where your mind thinks with a different brain. And then, but then when your physical brain starts to engage your senses, your eyes, your ears, and everything, it's almost painful coming back into the body because you realize how sluggish reality in the body actually is. Everything's so like heavy, slow, and everything felt like slow motion. Like when I saw people speaking to me, it felt as though like, oh my God, you poor people. You just have no idea how fast the universe really is. And you're just so slow, you know, you're like, and I was slow too. I was, and you know, and so a few months later, I had that sleep paralysis and I was 19. I, actually, when I got into the accident, I was in the passenger seat. It was for my 19, 19th birthday. I was 18 turning 19 when that was in June. Um, and then it was in October that I had the sleep paralysis. And that's when I wrote this stuff down. And I think that part of this, what the sleep paralysis did is it, it jarred a kind of recognition of a piece of what I had felt and seen and in that, um, in that near death experience, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that the near death experience is the source for begotten, but I am saying that those two incidences, the sleep paralysis and the near death experience opened a larger scope of vision that enabled me to comprehend something that was much larger than myself. And I knew that the thing that was cool is that I did know that, that I was, uh, that something much larger than me was moving through me. I never thought like, oh, I, I came up with this brilliant idea. It, it never really was about me. I really felt like I was just a, a laborer that, you know, was, was, was tasked with going out and finding the materials, you know, finding the theater. Oh, I need a 40,000 square foot space. Oh, well, if you want that, that's like gonna be, you know, millions of dollars for you to have complete and total control and access to. And then it's like, well, I need to build all this stuff for this opera. Oh, well, if you want to build all that stuff, that's going to cost you millions of dollars to do that too, hundreds of thousands to design it alone. So when I budgeted everything out and I was like, well, okay, then I'll take this idea and I'll turn it into a film because that's so much cheaper. So it's just this, when you think about the process, it's, it's kind of crazy and idiotic, you know? But, um, and then when I reached the end, after I shot Begun, I'm like, okay, well, how am I gonna turn this into the image that I see in my head? And it's like, it doesn't exist on film. So I was like, well, uh, I talked to a lot of people. I ran around New York City talking to everyone, to photographers, to painters, to sculptors, whoever I could find that would listen to me. And it turned out that they sent me to this person who was doing special effects on an optical printer. And so I said, well, can I learn how to use this thing? And they're like, that's gonna take you years to learn. And then I said, well, can I borrow it? 
and figure it out. And they were like, no, you know, no, this, this machine costs, you know, a quarter of a million dollars and no, you can't borrow it. So then I went to Camera Mart and I said to them, I said, okay, do you have a projector and do you have a camera that no one ever rents and no one ever uses and you're thinking about getting rid of it because it's just dead weight, you know, in your warehouse. And so they gave, they didn't give it to me. They said, we want it back. And, but they lent me this uh, 1936 16 millimeter Mitchell. And then I had the audacity to ask for a 35 millimeter Mitchell. And they said, you're asking too much. And so I took the 16 millimeter thinking that I was going to blow up Begotten to 35, which I'm still trying to do now, which I'm still figuring that out today, year, you know, decades later. And so they gave me that and they gave me this Italian projector, this old thing from like the 1920s. I mean, it was really old, but I had to put new uh, wiring in it and, uh, and a completely new lamp housing in it. So that became the projector side. And then I had to find a friend, you know, um, who was able to engineer and help me to build something heavy enough to keep it steady. Because what happens is, is as you shoot off frames on the camera, it shakes and creates this like tiny bit of shake that then blurs the image. So you have to stabilize everything and then you have to synchronize everything. So that takes, it was like a, it's kind of like an abacus, you know, like a very primitive, you know, sort of relay system between the projector and the... And I, I created something so basic and kind of... Um, I mean, it was beautiful. I have to find a photograph of it. I think there's only one photograph of me standing in front of this thing. And, but here's the funny part of it, right? I thought that this was mine now, right? And finally, it took me nine months to do tests and figure it out. And finally, when I started getting results, I realized this is going to work. This is beautiful. And then after I finished the film, this is years later. It took me four and a half years to make Begotten. So after I finished it, it, then it took me two years to try to find somebody to watch it. And trust me, I got thrown out of, I got thrown out of distributors, film offices all over Manhattan. I mean, you know. And I even walked into like the fifth distributor and they're like, oh, you, we've heard all about you, you know. You have the non-film film that you want, that's silent, that has no dialogue and it's black and white and you want to distribute it. And I'm like, yeah, that's me. And they they were like, I don't think that's going to happen. So instead of giving up, what I did is that was the point that I made the six VHS tapes and just sent them out like, like a message in the bottle. And one of them reached, I sent, I was, I don't know why I did it, but I sent it to the Pacific Film Archive in San Francisco. And it was from there that the director of the Film Archive called me three weeks later and said, I have films from all over the world. We have the largest archive and I've never seen anything like your film. And he goes, I, and, and I said, well, what do you think? You know, and she was like, I think it's astonishing. Do you mind if I show it to some people? And she wound up, showing it to, um, to Tom Luddy and to Peter Scarlett. And Peter Scarlett was running the uh, San Francisco Film Society at the time. Peter Scarlett called me up. And at the time, this was the age of landlines and message answering machines that had tape in them, that, that taped your message. So at one time I came home and I get this message saying, I'm trying to reach, you know, Edmund Elias, you know, marriage, you know. He goes, excuse me if I'm mispronouncing your last name, but I just watched your film Begotten that I got from so-and-so at the Pacific Film Archive, and I think it's astonishing. I think it's a masterpiece. And I thought thought some of my friends were pranking me, you know, at the time, because I had so many rejections. You have no idea that it was uh, astonishing to get this message. So... Of course, I called Peter back, and, um, and, uh, and he said, we want to show this film at, at our film festival, at the San Francisco International Film Festival. The smartest thing I ever did, smartest thing I ever did, was 
I had the print of Begotten, and I sent it out three months ahead of uh, the festival. So I just figured I would just send it to them, you know. And it was the smartest thing I ever did because what Peter did is instead of having it, leaving it sitting on his desk, everyone that, that came in asking him, is there anything interesting in this year's film festival? He had a print of the film. So he showed it to Susan Sontag, he showed it to August Coppola, who's the composer of, you know, and Francis Ford Coppola's brother. And August loved the film and he started telling everybody at Zoetrope about the film. And then he told uh, Dennis Jacob. Dennis Jacob was the ghostwriter for Francis Coppola. He's just this brilliant guy. And, um, and so I wound up getting this phone call from Susan Sontag and she called and I thought it was my ex-girlfriend. I thought, because I, she knew how much I loved Susan Sontag. And, and at first I started going along with the prank. And so I started pranking Susan Sontag and she said, she said to me like, like, no, this is really, she goes, you don't think I'm Susan Sontag? And I said, no, I don't. <laughs> and she said, well, that's really funny because I am. And then I, in my, I think my face went white because she was so dead serious. And she said, listen, I, I want to show your film in my living room to a group of friends. She goes, I think your film's a masterpiece. I love it. She said, I, there's something about it that I have not seen anywhere else and I want other people to experience it. And so from there, that's when, that's when things, I mean, I credit, I credit Susan Sontag, I credit the great French film director, Chris Marker, who, uh, I don't know if you know his films, did La Jete and, and Sans Soleil, did a bunch of amazing films, uh, and, and Werner Herzog with, uh, you know, getting, getting the film out there. Because until they said, this film is worth looking at, like, nobody else would give me the time of day. So, you know, I really uh, owe a lot to them. And that, a lot of that, so what I'm trying to tell you right now is that you think you can control your life and your direction. You can't. It's, it's just so much of life is luck. You know, it's where you are. It's who's in the room with you. And it can lead to great fortune, you know, or it could lead to misery, as you know. So, you know, there's something, uh, I'm glad you made me <laughs> get into all that. Does that answer your question at all? <laughs> oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, do we have more questions? More questions from the audience? Yes? And to tie in with your last answer, was it also difficult to get the two sheikles uh, uh, screened at the big screen because they are so short? And usually, in cinemas, you see feature-length films and not shorts, or perhaps at festivals. Be, you're, you're talking about the length of the films. You, you, no, yes, the Din and and Poly and Blastimo, the short films, right? And yes. so it is often more difficult to get short films screened at, at uh, yeah, cinemas than than feature-length films. It's it's almost impossible to get short films shown, and the short film format is some of the most creative stuff is done in the in short films. So it's almost a crime that short films don't get larger distribution. What happened with Den of Celestial Birds is that it was part of the commission was from the Hermes Gallery in Paris. So after I finished the film, they loved the film and showed it at the Hermes Gallery in Paris. So it got to be seen as a kind of installation there, but then it was also part of the, it went to Telluride Film Festival where it was shown. But I think a large, uh, well, I, I think it screened there, but people didn't quite understand it, even at that festival. And then um, Turner Classic Movies played it as part of their short film festival series. And the greatest thing about that is that is that Din of Celestial Birds was sandwiched between a short by Stanley Kubrick and a short by Francois Truffaut. So I figured, okay, 
I can just, I can quit now because that, what, what great company to be in. But the short film is a very much, is very much a problem, uh, you know, in terms of distribution. But what's great about these three films together is that they create a, um, they create a, a, a single film. So this trinity becomes one unity that is two hours and four minutes long. And so in that regard, um, they each complement one another and, and help one another out and create an experience. And so ultimately where I want to go with this is I want to create these, you know, big screen, you know, immersive experiences that integrate live music and, uh, and singing and voices and, uh, you know, really create this immersive multimedia experiences that, that, that become precious memories for the people that participate in them or experiencing them. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have time, I think, for one more question. Somebody in the so, back. There you go. I have a short question. <laughs> what was your favorite actor you worked with in your entire career? Well, you have the last question, so you can ask a long question. Uh, well, that's, I don't know. Um, Think about it. I'll answer your first question. Okay, um, I get two questions. You get two questions. My favorite actor? Mm. I, I loved working with John Malkovich because he and I had a closeness and Shadow of the Vampire because he... First of all, my meeting with my first meeting with John Malkovich was in Marseille, and that was a crazy event um, because he didn't want to do the movie, and I sort of like not forced him to have lunch with me, but kind of was just like, please, you know, like really begging him to just meet with me and let me just share a few ideas. And I think he he also loved Begotten you know, at the time. And so he invited me to, Mar he said, look, if you come to Marseille, I'll have lunch with you and you can tell me whatever you want to tell me. So he picked a place for lunch and it was this balcony that is right on the bay there, you know, like right where all the fishermen are. And so he sat in the shade and I sat kind of like halfway in the shade and in the sun, and the sun was moving this way. So during the course of a three-hour lunch together, um, I got severely sunburned on the right side of my face. The left side of my face was just pale, you know, like a pale white. So when we parted after the lunch, he just was smiling, transfixed <laughs> by my half sunburnt face. And, and there was something very endearing, though, about, about it. But, but the meeting was just fantastic. It was one of those things where the two of us got together and we just exploded with, uh, he had read the script, but what I started presenting is a whole new proposal for the direction, you know, that was very different from what the original, not too different, but different enough from the original script. And he was really vibing with me and loving what I was talking about. And, um, so we wound up having this great conversation that ended with, listen, I'm supposed to do this film with, with Johnny Depp that's coming up, you know, in next year, next spring, which, which interferes with what you want to be doing next spring. So I don't know if I can do it, but listen, you know, I want to do this with you. Just give me, give me a couple weeks to figure this out, you know. So he, he called two weeks later and he said, you know what? I want to do your movie. And he said, and I'm filming in Paris in January. And he said, why don't you come to Paris and, you know, while I'm filming, let's go over some of your ideas, you know, and, your, and you can make script changes while I'm filming this other movie and we can go over it at night, you know, we can go over it in the morning. So he had this incredible generosity that without that generosity, I don't think the film would have been as strong as it is. Now, and we also uh, made each other dinner, you know, during the course of filming, he 
stayed in a guest house behind my apartment. And there, these were these very old stone buildings, you know, in Luxembourg. And so I would go out and every evening we would just break open a, a bottle of wine and we would just cook for each other and hang out and talk about, you know, everything that we were going to be filming in the following days. And I think that that really lent itself beautifully to the way that I like to work, you know, because on poly and blastema, the kind of thing is like, you know, Gavin would come over, we'd have a meal, we would talk, you know, and, you know, and then he would go back and write some other passages of music and we would talk through poly and blastema. And it's just a beautiful way of working and it's a great way establishing like, like a genuine friendship on a deep level. And so, so that was with John, but I have to say that in terms of the longevity of a friendship, my longest friendship that is a genuine friendship, that is not because I'm a film director or because, you know, well, I mean, it is because we made a film together, but it, with Willem Dafoe, I have a very profound friendship and, and a real one that it's not about like, well, what are you writing now? What are you doing? Do you have a role for me? It's none of that. It's just, it's just real life stuff. And, you know, whenever he's in LA, we spend time together and, um, and I just, I love, I love Willem. Yeah. So I can ask you a second question. Yes. Okay. Uh, what's your uh, favorite phase in filmmaking pre-production? Do you like writing better? Do you like to direct the actor? Do you like uh, the visual aspects, cinematography? What inspires you the most? And where do you feel comfortable? And where do you feel uncomfortable? Do you feel uncomfortable with the money, with the production companies, with the producers, with the executive producers? Do you like, um, do you like to have a lot of control over your project? Mm. And, uh, and by the way, I, I think I met you uh, in Las Vegas, like more than 20 years ago. I was there with a bunch of students from uh, UNLV. Were you at that film festival in Vegas? Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and you presented uh, Shadow of the Vampire. I was a student there. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. Well, it's good we to see. a bunch of students telling the story. It was really interesting. Yeah, I, re I remember that. Yeah. I remember you remember that. Vegas? Yeah. Yes. I remember it well. Yeah, of course. Unfortunately, I remember everything. Um, but yeah, I, I do remember that. That was, that was a lot of fun. Um, my favorite is being surrounded with just brilliant people that I love and working, working out problems, filming. I love, I understand cameras, I understand light, I understand color, and I understand people. I love working with actors. Um, and uh, I like being able to access places within my collaborators that, that they didn't know existed within them or places that they weren't even familiar with within their own talent. Um, so I like that exchange. So, pr so production is, some, is my favorite thing. If I could spend the rest of my life, you know, placing a camera and blocking out a scene, I'd be incredibly happy. Hitchcock said that everything is done in pre-production. That's where all the work is done. I would, I, would I would disagree. I would disagree. I would, and I don't even think, you know, I don't even think Hitchcock was serious. Um, <laughs> because, because so much, there are so many beautiful accidents that happen along the way that to say that it was all, you know, anybody who says that they stuck to the letter on their storyboard has made a very boring film. Or they made, a, or they made an exercise in, in, you know, in style or structure, you know. The only, the only film that I could imagine that really applying to is, is a film by Chantel Ackerman um, and, uh, and it's so brilliantly executed that I imagine that she 
really mapped out very, very clearly each shot and each emotion. But, but, but sometimes it does turn to a nightmare. I heard some uh, story about Apocalypse Now with Marlon Brando. Yeah. And he didn't want to do the lines. And uh, Coppola and the first AD and the cinematographer had a really hard time. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it took weeks before he came out of his uh, trailer. Yeah. Uh, because uh, I knew the, the assistant director, Jerry Zismer, who worked on the yeah. Apocalypse Now. And uh, I know film uh, is about rewriting. They always TV, it's always rewrite the dialogues along the film. Coppola always, you know, even after the film is uh, finished, they, they rewrite it in the editing room. But sometimes it can be a nightmare, I suppose. Yeah. There are some actors, uh, you know, I had that experience with Ben Kingsley. I like to, I like to rewrite uh, scenes up into the moment that I'm shooting. And somebody like Ben Kingsley was, he was someone who memorized his lines. So the draft that you gave him, like, which for me, like belonged to the, like the Neolithic age, you know, it was just so ancient, it's like ancient history to me. Uh, that was the script that he memorized. And if you, and I, when I came at him with new lines, <laughs> At first, he was very polite, but then he freaked out. You know, it's just like, you know, man, I, I memorized my lines, and then I don't want to think about them. And I said, you know, I, I completely understand. I really do. I said, the problem is, is that the structure of your character is something that I'd like to build out on. I'd like to make it, you know, I'd like to, right now, you know, there are some details that I really feel are missing. And so I would have to, uh, you know, it's, it, a lot of it is, is, is hand-holding someone through what you're, getting them into your mind. If, if there's one talent that you need to have as a film director, it's enabling other people to see what you're seeing, you know, and to feel what you want to be feeling from a specific moment or scene or whatever it is. And if you can't communicate that and it's all in your head, then they, then, you know, they, they lose confidence. I'm just going to come back on my seat. But if we could all uh, give a warm applause to Elias for coming and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for all your questions and I hope we'll see you all tomorrow at the screening. Thank you. Yeah, tomorrow's going to be an experience. Cheers. Cheers. Congrats. Congrats <laughs> to you.